Hi guys, SoDubs here and today I'm doing a video review on the Samsung Q60T. Now the one I've got in front of me is the 65 inch model. Yes, it takes quite a lot of space. This TV can be found for around £1,200 to £1,500 in the UK, which seems pretty steep given that the US price is around $1,000. Actually, you can find it for a little bit cheaper than that. Now if you live in these territories or indeed elsewhere, the locally link in the description below will take you to your localized Amazon store. Now before jumping into the review, if you do have in Instagram, please do send me a follow. It'll be down in the description below also at totally dubbed. That'll be very much appreciated. So without further ado, let's get into the review. So first off, let's talk about specs. Now the Q60T that we've got over here is very similar to the Q65T, which seems to be pretty much identical other than the fact it's got different colored stands. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Now it's not to be confused with the Q60R, which was the 2019 model. Now the Q60R has been replaced by the Q70T. It's a little bit confusing, but all I'll say over here is that if you're accustomed to the Q60R range, then it shouldn't be compared to the Q60T, which is in fact a kind of new entry level to the Quantum Dot range. On that note, this TV is the cheapest QLED Samsung 2020 TV that the manufacturer offers. So therefore, if you're looking for a little bit of comparison between the models, do check out on Samsung's website. They've got kind of like a scrolling thing that you can see and you can choose between the models. Now in terms of raw specs, this is a 4K TV. It does have a um, motion rate of 120 plus, and I'll get into that in just a bit. It's got 20 watt RMS speakers, which I'm going to touch upon in just a bit in terms of sound quality. In terms of inputs and outputs, you've got three HDMIs, one of which is eARC compatible. You've got a Toslink optic you've got your cable and antenna um, plugs as well and you've got two USB ports as well if you want to charge or plug in something directly to the TV. This does also have Amazon Alexa built in alongside Samsung's own Bixby voice assistant. Now I'm not a massive fan of voice assistants but if you are you'll be pleased to know that that is compatible so when you come to set up the TV which is actually done via a phone with a smart things app then what will happen is it will ask you if you want to set up a voice assistant. You can do this at a later stage through the TV directly. Might be a bit more of a faff to enter your password or your Amazon um, account. Now next up, let's talk about the product dimensions. Now of course this is gonna be variant depending on which model you go for. This is the 65 inch TV. The product dimensions of the 65 inch TV are on your screen. Now what doesn't change between the models, um, between the Q60T or Q65T models, is the fact that this has somewhat uh, pretty poor stands. Now the stands are made out of plastic, at least hard plastic as you might imagine, but it does mean that the TV does feel, well, quite wobbly. Um, if you've got a floorboard or something like that which is a little bit weak or let's say uh, you have uh, pets or uh, young children in the house then you might want to wall mount this TV instead because truthfully I don't feel that that sort of um, quality should be acceptable in a relatively expensive um, TV. Now next up we've got the actual physical remotes. Now as I mentioned before you can set this up via your smartphone via the SmartThings app. Now via the SmartThings app you can also control the TV via your phone but if you're like me and prefer actual physical remotes then you've got two included. You've got one which is more of a traditional one where you've got a lot more buttons and uh, different uh, different settings over here that you can access and one which is a little bit sleeker which is one that I actually use with my uh, 59, 55 uh, Q9FN. The control itself is of a good weight, it feels good in terms of in your hand and it's got um, a, a, a seizable size so it's not too small, not too large either. Uh, you've got the voice control as I mentioned before with um, uh, Amazon Alexa or Bixby um, and these ones are basically ambient modes, you've got the 1, 2 and 3 that's uh, basically like your, your normal uh, buttons that you'd expect on a more traditional traditional remote like this and then you've got the, um, the control. So these controls are the ones which you're probably going to use the most uh, simply because if you're uh, accessing the uh, the screen uh, screen settings then you can see over there um, these are the ones that you're going to use the most. But anyway your mileage may vary. All I'll just say is that the remote quality at least the, the build quality and design of it is perfectly fine and I quite like what uh, Samsung have done over here. Now next up I just want to touch upon the menu system within the TV. So over here you can see there is a whole host of different 
different apps which have been pre-installed when the TV comes. Now you can remove these, you can rearrange them as well and of course you can install other apps if you so wish. What's interesting to note is that if you go down on the remote it goes to a different screen which essentially pauses or stops the content that you're currently watching and therefore has this. Now I'm not a massive fan of this menu system over here. I would have liked it not to be included or have the option not to even go into it but nevertheless this is what Samsung has decided. My settings aren't absolutely perfect but I thought to actually share them in this video for you guys. Now there are certain settings for example that are going to be greyed out depending on the terms of input. Now in these things you will notice picture clarity settings. Again these will be dependent on what type of content you watch. You've got the contrast enhancer, film tone, color tone, gamma, white balance um, and also the color space settings. And you've got different uh, picture modes so in my case I use standard. You've got dynamic, natural and movie for example. I prefer standard just because of the overall color tone and how it looks like on the screen. Now in terms of the sound I'm going to touch upon this in just a bit but it's just worth bearing in mind that you've got the sound output, you've got the sound mode so here I prefer adaptive sound over standard and amplify when you're using the built-in TV speakers. Through the expert settings you can see in terms of what it picks up so for example if you've got audio formats in other words if, if it's got uh, sort of processing uh, it will pick it up uh, versus your normal uh, PCM input and then you've got the eARC mode if you so wish if you do have something that's compatible with that and you've got auto volume you've got the sound feedback as well and you can adjust the delay as well. In terms of broadcasting it really depends on where you live in this case I'm on the YouTube app so therefore this is kind of block blocked out but this is pretty much natural. In the general uh, one you want to if you want to configure your voice assistant you'll go through this menu network this will be for your Wi-Fi which you'll want to connect in my case I use it on the 5 gigahertz frequency it didn't seem to have any problems and then um, you can also look for a software update which in my case I'm on the 115 version which is at the time of making the video the latest one then you've got terms and privacy if you want to read that for some reason so that is my settings and that is the uh, menu system of uh, this uh, TV and now we get on to the performance. Now first off I want to talk about the sound quality. Now truthfully if you're going to get this TV you should get a soundbar, you should get a dedicated audio system or a hi-fi system. If you've got any sort of um, budget in mind ask me down in the comments below I'll give you my suggestions. But as we're doing a review of this TV I should actually give you a demo of the built-in speakers. Now this has got two channel speakers, it's got a 20 watt output and what I did is I compared it to my 55 um, Q9FN and also my dedicated HWN850 soundbar by Samsa. Now the little sound demo that you're going to hear is going to be come from my friend Priya. Her song is Falling. It will be down in the description below if you want to use it as a reference as well. And furthermore, we'll give you an idea of how these three devices will compare. Now in terms of my subjective opinion, I will say that the TV does an okay job, it's not amazing but it could do a lot better when it comes to dealing with action scenes um, or let's say when I was listening to Priya's song, the bass just wasn't coming out as I would like it to do. As I said, it has got built-in speakers which are perfectly acceptable for basic watching. So for example, if you're going to watch news or let's say listen to a podcast, but as soon as you start playing back um, things that are going to be a little bit more demanding or taxing in terms of the audio then I would very much urge you to go and get a dedicated audio system. And now we get on to the picture quality which is by far the most important part of this review. Now first off I want to talk about brightness. Now this panel has got a 4k panel and has got um, quantum HDR um, technology. I will say that having a peak brightness of 430 nits at least from my test is pretty disappointing for a TV of its class. 
Now what does this mean is that at 430 nits, in comparison to my 55 Q9FN that hits in excess of 1500 to 1, uh, 2000 nits, that this panel looks pretty poor when it comes to dark scenes. So for example over here, I know this is kind of like an off grey rather than a deep black, but the blacks don't come out as black as they should do, and the whites don't come out as bright as you might expect from an HDR TV that costs $1,000 or £1,200 to £1,500. I was expecting a far better quality in this respect, initially thinking it was my fault or something I was doing wrong when I was connecting my 4K Blu-ray player via a, a test disc that was then connected via HDR signal and uh, then connected up to the TV and then tested via Calibrator, which is the Data Color Spider-X Elite via a separate device. You can see there's quite a bit of a chain. In, initially, I thought I was doing something wrong until I looked online and I saw other people were claiming similar sort of numbers, at which point I said, oh, well, that's surprisingly low. To me, it was very, very surprising. And this does come across when it comes to the overall picture quality, because when you're looking at dark scenes, when you're looking at even colors and you just expect those colors to pop, it just simply didn't do it when it came to watching content on the Q60T. The colour accuracy could be a little bit better and just on the whole I just didn't feel as enticed to watch content on this TV as I do and I, and I did on my 55Q9FN which frankly is sensational as a QLED panel. At this price range I was expecting a little bit more from Samsung. And now we move on to motion blur or artifacts and also in terms of ghosting. Now VA panels have some sort of an issue usually speaking speaking when it comes to normal monitors and I've been somewhat accustomed to that when it comes to their TVs. Now on the Samsung 55 Q9 FN it does a fantastic job at handling motion blur and overall ghosting. In this respect the um, Q60T does an okay job. It's a little bit of a downgrade and you can see this specifically when you crank up all the motion blur settings. So when they're all cranked up you will notice a lot of artifacting and ghosting that's occurring if you do disable them all together, all of that pretty much goes out the window, but then you have to deal with jittering. So it's somewhat of a, um, a trade-off. Personally, if you use it and if you were to have this um, TV, I would use it on the custom setting with the jitter-free setting at around three and the rest of the things on there on auto or on off, depending on the content that you're watching. Now, as for its gaming performance, it's a little bit disappointing that AMD FreeSync is not included or FreeSync altogether is not included. If I'm not mistaken, the older line did have them. Again, the Q60R isn't the replacement or its, uh, its predecessor, but I think that had AMD FreeSync, which is better for those people people who have uh, consoles or even PC gamers who have AMD graphics cards, that would have been a benefit in order to have sort of a tear-free experience. That is not the case with this. In terms of the input lag, it is absolutely really, really good and really impressive, at least from my tests. But I will say, however, that when you do um, toggle those motion blur settings, that does impact the overall input lag and it doesn't make it um, a, a good experience. So in my opinion, if you're a serious gamer, you might want to disable all the motion blur settings um, and have the lowest input lag. But again, you're not going to get the trade-off with that sort of jittery type of feeling, specifically if you're playing fast-paced games, let's say like Call of Duty or, or Battlefield or, or, or some sort of similar game like that. Now I will say, however, one thing I was impressed with was in terms of its 4K upscaling. When I was using uh, Transformers at full HD via my 4K Blu-ray player and then upscaled by HDMI to the to the TV, I will say that the, the 4K content looked good. There was very little sort of noise or extra digital uh, noise that was occurring in this respect, and the TV does a fantastic job. I'm very much curious to see how the, the, the Q70 or Q80T would do in comparison to the Q60 or Q65T, purely because those ones have some sort of algorithms or AI 4K upscaling technology as well, which this panel doesn't but yet it still does a good job on the whole. So in this respect, I was pretty impressed. Now finally to round off this section, I do want to mention in terms of glare. Now I know it's not strictly in terms of panel, but it does affect your viewing experience. I noticed quite a bit of glare and you can probably see the reflection of my table in the background or potentially my legs over here on the on the TV. There is a bit of glare. Now this will depend on your, your setting that the TV is in. If you've got a lot of ambient light or a lot of artificial light like I've got on right now, 
but it's almost the first thing I noticed even in a complete dark room I could see myself waving on TV. Now in comparison to my 55Q9FN that isn't exactly a saint in that department either. It's not as good as let's say let, let's say old school plasmas or the old school LCDs which dealt with glare a little bit better because of the coating they had but this was a little bit worse and a little bit more noticeable in comparison to the 55Q9FN. So it's just something worth bearing in mind, something that I thought um, I should comment on and, and include in this review. And now this all leads me onto my verdict. Would I recommend the Samsung Q60T or specifically the 65 inch variant? Well, quite frankly, as I made it aware in terms of the image quality, I was left a little bit disappointed. I was expecting more, purely because I own a Samsung TV, which is a perfect example of what QLED technology is actually capable of. Now, granted, that was a flagship in 2018, whilst this is a budget entry range of the QLED TVs, but it still comes in at £1,500 to £1,200 in the UK and around $1,000 in the US. So it's not exactly a cheap TV. It's just that now in 2020, the prices have changed. So in this respect, the Q60T is a little bit of a letdown because I feel that people coming to the QLED range and don't have as much money to spend on let's say the Q70, 80 or or other ranges of, of Samsung's uh, QLED range, they will find themselves disappointed. It's just annoying because I know that QLED TVs can be good, but if someone comes across this TV, they'll be like, oh, I'm never gonna touch QLED again, and therefore Samsung pretty much lose a customer for life. Now, if this video has helped you to make an informed buying decision, let me know if you're gonna buy this TV anyway, or we're looking at it, or you know, if it's a couple of months or years down the line and you're still watching this video, then of course, subscribe, like, favorite, share. Yes, I had to plug it in right there, perfect timing. And of course, if you do have Instagram, as I mentioned at the beginning, do follow me on there. But again, let me know your thoughts. I'll be very much intrigued to hear your thoughts in the comments below. All right, guys, I've been totally dubbed. Take care and bye-bye.